All right, this is Ryan Womack, Data Librarian at Rutgers University Libraries, and we're back for part three of Hands-On Big Data. And this section is going to focus on using Amazon Web Services to spin up and run a few things on a Hadoop cluster. So part three, we're going to look at actually starting the Hadoop cluster and uh, configuring a web interface to that and then we'll take a break and come back in part four with uh, running pig and hive on that cluster that we just created. So those two parts are connected. All right. So Amazon Web Services is obviously Amazon is obviously one of the big cloud providers of services and there are others. We're going to look at Microsoft Azure um, in just a bit but most of the demo part here we're going to run on Amazon Web Services. So AWS uh, provides a lot of different hosting environments and it's, it's widely used. There, there are a lot of things you can take advantage of for learning and for setup. Um, it lets you quickly start and stop different servers and we have that raw computing power on tap and lots of things that are pre-configured for us that will save us setup time. So that's definitely all that is really good for our demo. Uh, on the other hand, these services are metered. We pay um, by the hour and the minute for the amount of computing that we're running. So if you leave these services on, uh, they will start to add up in terms of cost. and because we're relying on Amazon for the setup, obviously we have less flexibility compared to our own local installation. So, but what's good about this is it will give us some real running servers and give us a feel for how that works without taking a lot of time in setup. Although this will be uh, maybe s some of the more technical part about uh, the the workshop because you do have to get some of these details right in order to for these things to work. So in order to use Amazon uh, you have to get an, an AWS account from aws.amazon.com and if you have an Amazon shopping account your shopping account can be extended to also include Amazon Web Services. Uh, just follow the instructions um, here if you don't have an account. Um, just register for services with them. Now the one thing you want to be aware of is that it it takes a few hours for an account to become active. So and you also need to have a phone available for two two-factor authentication uh, for your account. So uh, if you want to pause the video set up your account and then come back once it's actually up and running uh, that would be a good idea if you're planning to follow along or you could watch it now and then go and try it on your own later. Uh, it does take a while to create to create a running account. It'll let you create the account but when you actually go to start up a cluster you'll find that you haven't been granted privileges yet until they review the account. Just a little warning for you. And um, a little bit later, we will be using the Amazon command line interface. Uh, this allows you to run uh, Amazon cloud services directly from your terminal and uh, can be quite useful. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this later, but the instructions on how to configure that are on this slide. Um, the other thing I should mention is we are going to, we're uh, working in the Linux environment on my computer. Uh, Mac experience will be very similar. Um, what we really want is just this direct access to a terminal where we can type commands. And you can do these things on Windows with PuTTY, which is uh, a program that you can, is, a, is a free download. Um, that provides a simple command line interface. Um, you can just Google that putty and you'll see the, the download options. What I would actually recommend for the long term if you're interested in experimenting is Sigwin. C-Y-G-W-I-N. Uh, Sigwin lets you cr 
install a much more full-featured Linux-like environment on your Windows machine that you can run a lot of the apps that are uh, applications and commands that are called for. So you have to recognize that the big data world is mostly a Linux world because we're talking about cheap machines that were, you know, when you buy a hundred machines and, and link them together to, to make a cluster, you don't want to buy an OS, a license an OS for every instance there. You want to run something that's free and basic on those machines. So the default environment uh, when you're actually on those machines is going to be Linux and you kind of have to get used to that. Um, I think in my opinion it's better to make that jump at the beginning and and get a good Windows environment on your Windows machine that you could perform some of those functions. But I'm not going to go into the setup of SigWin. Um, you can look for other um, information and, and the information on the SigWin page about that. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the Amazon services themselves. If you have gotten into your Amazon account, uh, you will see your, your starting page is a page that has many different uh, options of lots of different kinds of services that Amazon provides. We are only going to use three of those in detail. So EC2, um, let me just mention them first, EC2, EMR, and S3. So EC2 is the Elastic Compute Cloud. This is where we have the ability to create a virtual server on Amazon's cloud server systems and we can expand it and allocate resources dynamically. That's why it's called an elastic compute. We can add additional servers, we can clone uh, setups that we have and spread them out to other machines. Um, makes it very flexible like that. EMR is, is their Elastic Map Reduce service. And Elastic Map Reduce is simply a Hadoop cluster uh, configured by Amazon to run on their EC2 service. So it automates the creation of a cluster and takes care of a lot of the, the detail work for you. That's what we're going to be using in just a second. And then we're also going to be using storage from the S3 service. So this is their scalable storage service and provides an easy way to, to, to save and access data in the cloud. So let's proceed with this and talk about a few more details that you'll need. Um, so actually when we, when we launch servers we, incur, we start to incur the billing costs. Um, every machine that you run, the amount of resources that are allocated to that machine costs money. Um, it should cost, l I, it says around five, it really should cost less than five dollars uh, for this workshop if you are only got a machine up for two hours or something on Amazon Web Services. If you leave them on, it gets expensive. So um, I did leave computers on for a couple of days and, and ran up my bill. You know, it'll be twenty, thirty dollars a day if you leave um, these machines running in the cloud. Especially because the, the Hadoop server is, is a, by default a large installation. It's not just a little simple web server because it's designed for big data. Um, it's a little more expensive. All right. So and it, so the next setup issue is in order to work with our cloud computer, we need some authentication me mechanism, and we need an Amazon key pair. So Amazon provides great help for this. You can work through their documents. I've linked uh, that here. And I'll just quickly walk you through the creation of that. So we, if we go to our EC2 page, um, the EC2 page has uh, essentially has more full-featured options on management than the Elastic Map Reduce page. So we're going to go here. We are going to go to Key Pairs, and 
Um, I have an existing key here. I'm just going to delete that key and create a new one because that's I'll show you the process from scratch. If you're new to this, you'd have a blank screen like this and you'd, you'd want to say create key pair. Um, I'm just going to call it very simply Amazon key in this case. Click create and then I get the option to download the key. Now this is the important part that this is your one chance to download the key. If you don't download it here you're going to be in trouble. You need access to this key. You need to download it. You need to save it to some place that you will remember. So when I click save file here it saves it to my downloads folder um, and if I lose that key it's not actually that big a deal because I can always go back in and like I just did delete a key and create a new one and still have access to the same services. It's not like I've lost access forever um, but you do need to be careful how you manage that key on your own system. And if you're working on Windows that .pem format that this key downloads in will need to be converted by the the program Putty Gen. This is also mentioned on the slides. Um, Putty Gen will allow you to load uh, the PEM format key and then save it as a PPK key which is the format that you're going to need on Windows. There are instructions for that um, also on the Amazon um, site so you can just follow those. Um, I'm not again going to go into further detail about that. Another reason why the sort of native um, Linux, uh, Unix environments align a little bit better with the Linux Unix services up in the cloud. And I'm going to come back to the issue of security groups in a second because I want to actually launch my cluster so we can talk while we're waiting for it to start up. So let's now we're now we're really getting hands on. You you've gotten into Amazon Web Services and we're going to start our cluster up. So I'm going into EMR, uh, the, the home screen again where all these services are listed. The quick way to get to that is click on the cube up in the top left. We'll click on EMR and I have a list of you know various things that I've been creating and terminating in my experiments here. Um, and you should look here to s make sure that everything you've done in the past is terminated otherwise you're going to get billed for it. You can see here this is my cluster left running that, that ran up my bill uh, in May. So I'm clicking create cluster. Uh, let's call this YouTube cluster 2 and the short version of this is I can accept all the defaults except for if I scroll down to security and access I want to select the key pair that I just created. So you'll have named your key. It should show up in this list. You select that. Uh, you can leave everything else the same and go down to the bottom. Uh, on my machine this is a little bit obscured by my font size and just click create cluster. I'm not going to do that yet because now I want to go back and talk at least about a couple of these options. So we are going to save the logs of this uh, server over to S3. So S3 is your Amazon storage location and if we actually wanted to go back and read our our logs to figure out what's going on or discover sources of error this is the location we'd go to. In part 4 we'll be actually using S3 so you'll see that in more detail. Um, we have the option to start up different versions of the software so for again for this demo it's fine just to leave the defaults of Amazon and the latest version uh, but there are some changes you know in as Hadoop evolves uh, you may have something that only works on a prior um, version or you've you've tested 
something on a prior version, you just want to keep it running smoothly, you do have those options to, to go back and install an older version. Um, the Map R distribution of Hadoop is also available. In some of the later slides, we're going to talk about the companies that distribute uh, Hadoop, uh, pre-built Hadoop um, setups, and Map R is one of those. And we have certain applications that are going to be installed. We are going to be using these in just a minute. Uh, we have the option to add a few more. Uh, we're not going to use the other ones in the demo, so you don't have to install those now, but just be aware. Uh, these are also possibilities with AWS. And uh, I guess the other main thing to notice is the uh, setup of the cluster. By default, we get one master. The master, again, is the, is the computer that's tracking the instructions and collecting the, um, the jobs so it can reduce uh, the output. And the, the other instances, which are called core instances here, are the, um, if you will, the slave computers that are storing data. So the default is one master and two slaves, or two cores. That's fine. Uh, if you increase these numbers, you're going to add more expenses. Uh, this is enough to get a, you know, a little mini Hadoop cluster going. Um, you do have to keep the size at these extra large uh, because it is designed to run at, at scale. If you try to squeeze it onto a smaller computer, uh, which you have the option to do, uh, if, you, if you click here you'll notice these are all different configurations that you could access on AWS. Um, and you could get a lot of storage, a lot of memory, uh, some slightly smaller general purpose computers depending on the job that you're trying to run. Uh, but except the defaults here, it'll run just fine for the demo, and then later you could come back and experiment with that. All right, and we can actually configure these clusters to start doing things as soon as they, they start running uh, with the bootstrap actions and the steps, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, let me show you the security groups before I click Create. The last thing I'll show you. Uh, the default security groups are just fine for the demo right now. Um, but if we wanted to change it and, say, uh, create a, an open security group, which I'll talk about in a second, I could, I could do that here. And I can also click on Create Security Groups. All right, so right now I'm going to create the cluster because it takes a few minutes to spin up. I found it's relatively fast in Northern Virginia. Um, just observing other um, people in a, in a demo, uh, not every uh, region where Amazon has these cloud services will set up your computer as fast, um, but you're probably better off being in the region that is close to you, just for file transfer costs and in the long term, that's a good thing. All right, so we notice that our cluster is now starting. We've got some uh, descriptive information, how long it's been running, what we're trying to set up, uh, where the hardware is running. This is the zone US East, 1C. And once it does start up, some of these other fields, like the monitoring, will actually fill in with uh, information about the live computers. They're not set up yet, so we don't have this option. If we go back up to our cluster list, um, we have my past terminated instances still here, but we have a green icon indicating that this is a live cluster that's starting up. And we can click back on it to go back to the detailed view. So while this is spinning up, I'm going to go back and talk about security groups because this is something useful. I think it's useful to know. You may not quite need it for this particular demo, but it's useful to know. So our Amazon services are running on the web and we need access to uh, web control interfaces for those services. And we may need to open up access to some things that are not typically open. So 
you can go to the again back to EC2 probably the simplest way to do this and on the left hand side we have security groups if I click on security groups uh, I will be presented with a list of and I don't know why this is not really filling in in the display um, I should get a list of security of the I have 18 security groups that I've created by uh, just sort of playing around here. Um, I don't know why they're not popular. Here they are. I, my s window was rolled up. And so I can see these are some past uh, demo things that I created. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, I'm going to delete this one the YouTube open and just recreate it. So I, if I want to delete a security group I can click on the, the checkbox and go to actions and I can say I'm going to delete that one. Now let me create it anew. Create a security group YouTube open for demo. Let's call it just YouTube open and I'll say the description is demo for YouTube and down below I have my security group rules. So when you're just setting something up and just trying to get it working, um, you may not be really worried about security. Um, so in this case a completely open setup would be to leave all of the, the TCP traffic open. So I'm going to say all TCP and I'm going to say from anywhere. So anybody from anywhere can access any of the ports on the machine via TCP. Now this is not a good uh, security practice. If it was some, if I was working on data that I really cared about, I would, I would want to lock down and give much more controlled access to only the ports that were needed. But when I'm setting something up, I, I don't really know. Well, which of the ports is it going to tell me that it needs to connect on? Um, so I'm just going to open everything up. And so this gives me a security policy that I could apply to any running computer and say, you know, use the open security on that. Uh, and I can also create my own custom security that's more locked down um, and just manage them in this, in this interface. So the security groups, just like the key pairs and other uh, sort of security and identity management things are are saved. Uh, even if you shut down your virtual computers these things persist in the Amazon environment until you delete them. And so you can reuse them over and over. Alright, so that's my little talk. There is a slide uh, on the security groups um, should you choose to use those. Now I'm going to go back to my EC2 dashboard and I have three running instances so let's look at it in EC2. EC2 if you remember this is the raw computing side so we set up a master and two slaves and so here we see each of the three individual computers we see they're all three running um, two of them seem to have completed everything that's running on them and one of them is still initializing so we probably have something still running and I can see the elastic map reduced the EMR view treats that as one cluster so if I go to the one cluster uh, I can see it is now running it is still running a step so it's probably in the last phases of uh, installing one of these applications because um, it this will go away once it's completely finished. But this is pretty good. This is this means it actually set up in just a few minutes and we're able to continue the process. Alright, so the next thing we need to do is we need to enable the web connection. The web connection is what's going to give us the the easy interface to our Hadoop cluster. Because right now all we can see is that the machines are running. We're not doing real Hadoop at this point. I click on enable web connection 
and what's nice about Amazon again the, the instructions are really direct really good uh, the Windows instructions are here and you can use putty as your client to um, to log in and you can as I mentioned convert your key from PM to PPK using the putty gen program and again consult the, the Amazon help is quite detailed on this so you can use the Amazon help to fill in some of the details for Windows that I'm, I'm not showing you because I'm not on a Windows system here and the Mac Linux instructions are even simpler so what we need to do is open up a terminal and we just run this command alright so the nice thing about Amazon not only are the instructions detailed but the command is customized the command uh, remembers the name of my key I called it Amazon key and it's customized to my particular web instance right so what Amazon has done is it's set up uh, a web address where we can go directly to the our running cluster in this case the, it's matched to this IP uh, 50, 19, 45, 59, so the address incorporates that. And so we're going to log in as user Hadoop, which is the default name of the Hadoop uh, user that's running the Hadoop services on this machine. Alright, so I'm going to run SSH, the secure shell connection. Uh, when I say be familiar with your operating system, this is what I'm talking about. You shouldn't um, know what an SSH command is and have run this once or twice before at least um, even if you haven't run it before again Amazon makes it easy you just have to um, copy what they're telling you to do so I did put it in my downloads uh, folder so I do have to um, modify the path to include that that's the one change that I'm making and I hit enter uh, this is the first time I'm connecting so the authentic authenticity can't be established I have to say yes it's okay to connect and you'll see this warning this is for whatever reason not described in the Amazon instructions but uh, it does not like it if your key is too visible to groups and other users it wants to have a secure key that is only accessible to the the primary user account uh, so in order to do that I have to go into my downloads directory and the short way to do this is to type chmod uh, which changes the file permissions to 400 so I type chmod 400 and then the name of my key in the directory where the key resides so that should be enough to lock down the key um, and I'm gonna go back and run the command again okay so run that again and I should be okay here so actually I can now see um, that instead of saying enable connections I've got, I've got running connections uh, going on here uh, you may not see this yet because I've already done on this machine step two and step two you'd only have to do this once on a on a machine that you were planning to keep going back to AWS from is to configure a proxy management tool and the instructions are very specific uh, they look complex but they are are not um, we download the foxy proxy add-on to our browser so we can download this and install it we can also go to add-ons within the browser I'm showing you Firefox uh, the Chrome interface is going to look a little bit different but you can just 
I've already in installed mine and I'm going to actually enable it right now. Uh, let me go ahead and restart. Let's do that. Just make sure everything is doing doing well. And I've got a lot of uh, browser windows that were in other workspaces that I'm just going to clear out of here right now. So now Foxy Proxy is running. Um, again, to get it, I would just go to Get Add-ons, click Search, Search Foxy Proxy, um, and say Install when I've found it. Um, so mine is already installed. And I go to Preferences, and I want to make sure I have this option selected. Use proxies based on their predefined patterns and priorities. I hope that's visible for you, um, given the strange orange color on YouTube. So we don't want to use the proxy for everything. We don't want to disable the proxy. We want to use it based on predefined patterns and priorities. Okay, And then we want to take the instructions that Amazon gives us, which are, where are they? Um, I think I have lost that bit, I believe. Let's see. Well, that's too bad. So that piece was lost when I restarted my browser, the actual instructions, which um, I should be able to pull up again. Okay, yeah, so this is this is essentially the same instructions. So you will have a file that's presented to you. Just copy this text and put it in a text editor, paste it, and save it somewhere. You can save it as, uh, say, Foxy Proxy, as they recommend, Foxy Proxy settings.xml and just put it in your you know main directory someplace where you can find it so you don't have to modify this they give you the the um, the XML that is going to work and then you go into your foxy proxy in Firefox and let me go back to my add-ons here in preferences, in proxies, and I'm going to say add new proxy, automatic proxy configuration, and I'm going to find the file. Here it is, foxy proxy settings. Okay, so you, again, your um, menu screens may look a little bit different, uh, but you, even if you're doing it on Chrome, it's the same idea install the Foxy Proxy add-on. Save the text that's presented to you in the help file, uh, the XML part. Say, copy this, save it as a text file. You can name it Foxy Proxy Settings.xml or name it something else if you really want to. Um, go into the Foxy Proxy preferences and where is this? Okay, it's popped up another window. And go to automatic proxy configuration and point that to the file. Let me 
click OK. Um, is there a syntax error? I might have some clashing things because I've already configured this. I'm just I'm not going to worry about that for right now. I'm going to make sure that if if my browser is working, I'm not going to uh, try to debug that error. And again, make sure that you say use proxies based on their predefined patterns. You don't want to use it for everything because that'll um, mess you up when you're outside of AWS. Okay, so let's go back to out of the help and back to just the main AWS portal. And we'll go to EMR. Okay, so here's our cluster, and we now have these uh, web interfaces. You notice that these are actually running on those various miscellaneous ports. This is why, um, you know, sometimes in the setup you need to just leave a lot of stuff open until you figure out what port something is running on. And we're going to look at Hue. All right. So, again, we're running these as demos. These are created for the first time. We're not really worried so much about secure passwords and things. Um, I'm just going to call myself admin and I'm just going to put in um, something here as a password. The first time you... Oh, I need to put in some special characters. Let's do this. Okay. So now it's allowed me in. It should allow you to this. If you haven't gotten to this phase, um, it's it's probably due to your your proxy settings. Um, uh, you know, if your if your cluster shows that it's running, it's started and running in the status, um, and you haven't modified anything else from the defaults, uh, something is probably blocking your access to the web interface. Uh, so make sure you, you follow those Foxy Proxy instructions. Um, make sure that you've got uh, your key, you, you've followed those instructions to enable the, the uh, remote access. Um, but these should, should change to live links when they're available. So hopefully you've been able to get to this point and what we have in Hue is a management interface for the Hadoop cluster. Um, so we have query editors for our, our query languages. We have a file browser that lets us look around and see where files are, upload files to the cluster, download output from the cluster. Uh, we can see what jobs are running on the cluster and if there are any problems with those. So this is going to be our our working environment for right now. So for logistical reasons I'm going to pause the uh, recording of the video right now and I'll come right back to it and we'll get into pig and hive.